Salon Culture, Culture Action Europe Podcast. Welcome everybody to the first Kai Salon Culture uh, podcast where we discuss cultural policy developments with experts, policy makers, members, partners and friends of Culture Action Europe. I'm Rosa Perez, uh, Senior Policy Officer at Culture Action Europe, and today we are here with Lars Evert. He's Senior Advisor at ELIA, the European League of Institute of the Arts, board member of Custom Pellegrini and Culture Action Europe. Hello, Lars. Hey, Rosa. Nice to be here. <laughs> We're thrilled to have you with us uh, for our first episode, focusing on education and the arts. So. My first question for you all would be, past debates on education have focused a lot on developing skills for employment that were centered in science, engineering, technology and math. But increasingly, we have uh, louder voices in favor of STEAM with A, multidisciplinary approaches and the need to include intercultural competences, creative skills, encouraging a critical disposition as part of core competences for future generations. Why do you think the approach is changing? Why do you think we have this uh, renewed push for a change in the education agenda? Well, that's... A very exciting question, but um, let me go back a little step because um, I just want to remind us that um, also in the arts and in higher arts education, in all fields, theater, dance, visual art, design, music, uh, employment and um, the impact on the market, so to speak, has played an evenly big role than in the STEM uh, disciplines. So we've gone down that road a lot to prove um, how we uh, employ people to find a job, artists who are not only in their studio or on the stage, but who go out into society, work, uh, sustain themselves, make a difference in social contexts, in education, in uh, city landscapes, in urban contexts. Um, but. Interestingly, whereas intuitively I would have thought that uh, the arts education field would explore even deeper links with, let's say, humanities and social sciences, uh, the hard sciences are really an exciting field of collaboration for, for the arts at the moment. And I think probably there's a kind of meta development out there. I mean, People talk about the fourth industrial revolution coming on, uh, which basically says that our jobs are, will all soon be taken by artificial intelligence. And we can either be very afraid about that or uh, see what we as humans can actually mean in that kind of changing world. And there, it's really interesting to see what the World Economic Forum, uh, when they last met in Davos, said that in that context of the fourth industrial revolution, creativity will be in the top 10 skills. It will be the third, thirdly highest rated skill next to problem solving and critical thinking. And I think that the STEM subjects see really clearly that the A subject, which would make it, make it STEAM, the art subject, is where we have a huge experience in dealing with creativity in a curriculum in research also, in arts research, and, and how that research is not only inspired by the STEM subjects, taking on methodologies from them, but also the other way around, challenging them and saying, hey, listen, my artist studio is as much a laboratory environment as your uh, physical studio or as your um, mathematical experimentation. And I, as an artist, can make as much a fundamental research that disrupts your thinking as your research can disrupt my thinking. And only that kind of disruption um, is what generates progress for us. So I think there is a kind of synchronization of, um, let's say, uh, the need to take a step forward in the de development of our subjects. And there, uh, the STEM subjects find the arts and I think that in the next five to ten years, 
um, a lot more collaborations between artists and hard scientists will take place and that this will somehow develop both areas. So I'm really, I find it a logical development and I'm really very positive about um, how the integration of the arts into, into the um, academic canon but also in the discipline canon as we recognize it in the, uh, in the society at large, how that will progress. That's very interesting. Shall we unpack a little bit this concept of creativity and innovation? Because as you were saying, there is this push and need, social need for disrupting and rethinking how we do things. But at the same time, there is a lot of social anxiety linked to this fast development. This, there is this motto in Silicon Valley of uh, move fast and break things. And if things are broken, well, uh, they are broken. So should we rethink different approaches to creativity in order to ensure that the outcomes are socially healthy? How can we do that? Because in a way, creativity has always been thought as unbound, with no limits. Does it make sense to put uh, social limits to creativity or do we need to infuse them with values? How can we incorporate that uh, healthy approach to creativity in the curriculum? Um, I'm not afraid of limits because um, limits doesn't mean limitation. I, I would like to understand limits in the sense of a framework. If we frame creativity, Uh, that actually gives us the freedom to use it in a much stronger sense. Um, Roland Barthes has written this fantastic book about myth, uh, myths, modern myths, and I think one of the modern myths that he deconstructed was also that of the artist as the, um, as the one that is kissed by the muses and that uh, somehow out of some genius um, Uh, develops new ideas and, and, and progresses in thinking and production. I think that uh, creativity is first of all very hard work and um, an outcome of training and uh, discipline. Uh, like in any other disciplines also uh, success is um, in, uh, in training and discipline and learning. So I think um, what we've done in the arts in the last 10 years and, and certainly since the Bologna process gave us a boost to organize ourselves as a sector to be stronger um, in, that, uh, current, in that constant kind of um, constantly stronger market thinking so to speak. We had to be proactive and organize ourselves and we, we, we set up these frameworks of qualifications where we defined what an artist has to be able to know, what skills an artist uh, has to be able to apply and how it, he, apply, he or she applies it. That kind of set of knowledge, skills and competences or attitudes. We've defined that in great, great detail so we put on paper what we expect from people that come into our academies and what we expect them to be able to do in society when they leave us. And that includes that we describe how, how they learn about creative processes. It can't any other to, to describe these very specific and very generic competences because otherwise we can't teach it. So, so it's written down on paper and that makes it as, uh, accessible also. And it doesn't say that it makes the outcome predictable, but the process of an artist um, coming in with his or her personality and developing first a set of skills, but then alongside that, the personality that goes with it, that together uh, gives the creative potential. And um, I'm sure other disciplines would also say, well, the personality for us is ev evenly important. And there I would say, um, and I know that people don't like to hear that the arts are not so exceptional to other subjects. <laughs> But on that line, on moving towards policy and the practice of policy, we have a, an exciting new communication on strengthening the European identity through education and culture. What's, what's your take on the communication? Do you think there is scope to 
I mean, first of all, um, very generally, um, you've mentioned the employability earlier. I think the communication takes us a, not away a little bit, but broadens the focus a little bit from our fixation on um, on, 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 on uh, new skills for new jobs, jobs and growth, whatever, uh, employability, um, and puts all of a sudden the unity of Europe, the inclusivity, the European narrative, all these kind of things uh, center stage. Which is understandable, of course, Europe uh, is fragmenting more and more, people are getting into a panic, so to me this communication reads much, very much as a panic communication, a quick fix, so to speak. So that's the negative take on it. On a more positive note, when I read it, I get excited because um, coming from education, um, but also from culture, I feel that we are at a turning point like in 1999 when the Bologna Declaration was was put out, which was in a way out of desperation also. We couldn't make laws to unify European education because that's just uh, in, uh, legally impossible. So we started the stakeholder process to bottom up define standards. And through this stakeholder process, all of a sudden we had a great alignment in Europe and we opened up this European area of higher education which makes student movement much easier, which makes comparability of degrees much easier. We're not there yet, there's a lot to do, but we, we achieved a lot with this bottom-up approach. Now, when I read this communication correctly, um, what we did already for this small layer of higher education, all of a sudden, this window opens for the whole lifespan. Mm -hmm. And we could start to think, what does it mean to, to grow up as a European citizen? And what do we learn from a very early stage, from cradle to grave, so to speak, the very old lifelong learning concept comes to mind. And I think whatever will be the consequent, the next steps of that communication, whatever kind of um, impact the communication will have on funding programs, on policy initiatives, um, on public opinion, on our motivation to work, it is certainly a kind of broadening of the scope. And I think if we as a sector, and the, the funny thing is that we have to rethink our sector boundaries, we have already now interesting discussions because it's about education and culture. Mm -hmm. Do we bring the discussion together? Do we have two different discussions and bring it together at a, at a later moment? That kind of challenge is, I think, already a step forward. And maybe to finish on a very practical note, um, as you introduced me um, with very, that I'm wearing various hats, as all of us today wear, wear various hats, uh, for me it is extremely enriching to work in the cultural field as uh, being responsible for a program of a cultural center for Castro Peregrini in Amsterdam, but also work which is very local, and European at the same time, but uh, to also have the policy perspective from ELIA on a European level. Um, the Erasmus program, for instance, has provided both fields a great opportunity in the last years with the strategic partnerships to work where cultural players and educational players work together uh, on a leveled playing field. I'm not advocating now that the Erasmus program should um, do whatever. I'm just saying if we think in terms of possibilities how the sectors can come closer together, I think both the uh, producers of art and culture as well as those who educate the cultural producers uh, will, will only gain. There's nothing to lose there if we, if we think um, not only in synchron synchronicity, but if we if we inspire our thinking and think new thoughts by coming together, however, whatever form that will take. Well, I think that is very much uh, in the spirit of the times where policies cannot be only thought uh, top down, that it needs to be transversal, it needs to be bottom up, we need to break bridges. And I think with uh, this inspiring uh, horizon, we close you, we close the interview. Thank you, Lars, for sharing with us uh, your vision, vision and knowledge. Thanks so much for inviting me to this conversation. Stay tuned for more podcasts where we will continue to explore the important link between education and culture. Feel free to contact us if you want to contribute to this debate.